Shut up and sit down. So we're going to be talking about authentication for JS developers. So why even care about authentication? Well, um, in 2020, British uh, Airways, they uh, posted a tweet saying that in a matter of urgency, they were in get investigating the theft of some customer data. Well, that sense of urgency was absolutely there because they lost the personal and payment card details of more than 400,000 of its customer. And Eventually, they got fined about 20 million uh, pounds in, in fine for breaching the GDPR. Well, actually, that 20 million was a fraction of what the original uh, fine was because originally it was 180 million pounds, but it got reduced. So they were kind of lucky. Um, and, and then it stated that the uh, violations could have been afforded because they didn't have any sufficient you know, security measures in place to protect their systems and network and data. In fact, they didn't even have the basic like uh, multi-factor authentication in place. So that's why they got a, a huge fine. Uh, another example, uh, 2021, uh, for the people that are non-Dutch, this is uh, one of the municipals in the Netherlands. Uh, they got hacked because their admin password was uh, as simple as welcome 2020. Uh, in fact, they were so bad at doing their security, um, they uh, publicly exposed their entire firewall to the internet. So basically hackers could access almost any system that was uh, running for them. Um, a very cool one, uh, a reporter, he hacked an EU council meeting. Actually it was the, de the defense meeting. Um, he uh, got into that meeting by uh, the login information that was shared by one of the defense uh, ministers on their Twitter accounts. Uh, so this one is Daniel. He was actually in a call and then they called him out for being, you know, it's a criminal offense. But, you know, if you do not um, uh, uh, go along uh, correctly with authentication and with your usernames or your passwords, uh, they're very easy to, uh, to be compromised. Um, and in fact, how easy it can be to, to crack a password. So if you basically look at a password and you look at the number of characters and then what types of passwords that you have, so from numbers only to all the way to lowercase letters and symbols and uppercase, etc. Uh, basically, the line for having secure passwords is about here. So that means that your users should basically implement a password based off of um, a string that is uh, 11 characters or longer which makes them almost absolutely useless. But in fact, there's not even a need for cracking passwords because you know people, you can just ask them. So um, a couple of years ago already, somebody put this one on, up on the internet for people to check if their credit card was stolen. Uh, so people happily filled in the form and check if their credit card was stolen and actually just you know sharing all of the data uh, with uh, the malicious hackers in this case. Um, but also you can trick a lot of people. Um, a good example of the last period was that the German government might have lost tens of uh, millions in euros uh, because of a phishing attack. Uh, because what cyber criminals actually did, they created a copy of an official website and then they started you know, email campaigns and lured users to the site. They collected all of their details and then they actually filed requests for government aid on their behalf, uh, but they just changed the... Uh, um, the bank account number. Um, and my last one, it's the all time favorite. It's the password chain signup sheet by, uh, by Sean. Um, actually, if you see people in offices being this unaware of what type of risks there are with, you know, actions like this, um, I cannot really blame them. Uh, you know, people just do stupid things, uh, mostly not on an intentional basis, but yeah, we do. Uh, and that includes it's all of us here too as, uh, as developers. So my name is uh, Nick Hazemont, it's pretty hard to pronounce for all the English uh, uh, people, uh, CIO and Senior Online Architect here at Frontman. Been working as a developer for over 25 uh, years, so both in front end, back end and also mobile. 
Uh, also, I specialize in cloud, DevOps, CI/CD, and a personal hobby that you know also got a hold of my professional life is security and authentication. Um, so, what are we going to be talking about? Um, currently, if you look at the authentication and you know authorization spectrum on the web, we're talking mostly about OAuth two and the OpenID Connect standard. But I also want to show you how easy it can be how um, uh, to steal cookies, for example. So one of the things that happened at British Airways actually was done using this technique. Uh, and then I want to give you a little bit of uh, insight into what the future of authentication uh, uh, will uh, mean for us and, and how it will impact the way that we authenticate users uh, in a more secure way. So OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. Um, OAuth 2 has been around for a while. It started off with OAuth first. Um, everybody has probably used it. Uh, it's an open standard for access delegation, basically. And then uh, OpenID Connect is a simple identity layer on top of the OAuth 2 protocol. So actually in the workings, OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect uh, work for the most part in a similar way. They have the similar flows, but they have some, uh, some small difference. But first, the question is always, you know, what is actually meant with access delegation? So if we look at the uh, most important OAuth 2 flow that we have um, and that we use on the web is primarily the authorization code grant flow. Uh, and what that basically means is that if we have a, a resource owner, so a user agent, so your browser, uh, that runs an application. Um, the, the, the end user will be on that platform. And if they need to log in, uh, we are going to be uh, redirecting them to a third party uh, authorization server. Uh, that authorization server is something like, for example, Out0 or maybe uh, um, ADFS if you're more in the, the employee uh, domain. Uh, but it's some sort of an identity provider. And what will happen is, you know, um, from your browser, you will do a request um, uh, for authentication. So you're going to be redirecting the end user to your authorization server. You're passing in some parameters like a client identifier and some other uh, details. Um, and then you, you allow the user to log in on the authorization server. Um, Optionally, you can ask for some sort of consent or the user will be asked for some sort of consent to share the data from the authorization server back to the user agent. And so a authorization code with, um, will be uh, provided back. Uh, once the client receives that authorization code, you can exchange it for a access token or in the case of OpenID, both an access token and ID token. And those tokens are called bearer tokens. Now we'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, so once you have those tokens, you can basically, from a front end perspective, call an API, a secure API, pass that token along. Um, and in this case, it's the resource server. So it will check if that token is valid. Uh, if it has any information, it can decode it. And if it's valid, it will um, uh, provide back the response with the requested information uh, in the context of the user, preferably. So what are then the differences between OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect? Uh, basically, OAuth 2 uses opaque bearer tokens. So basically, it uses random strings for access tokens, uh, also for refresh tokens, of course, just opaque tokens that do not contain any information. If we look at the OpenID Connect standard, the tokens that are issued are JOTs or JWT or JSON Web tokens, uh, but they are uh, also bearer tokens. Uh, but they hold someone's uh, real identity within the token itself. So instead of just being a random string, it holds the information about that end user and or uh, the authorizations that user is allowed to. Um, the biggest difference and why uh, JWT has been, uh, been used more and more over the last few, few years is that because you can uh, put a payload in a JWT token, if you uh, send that token over to a resource server, that resource server can directly validate that token and uh, authorize a user to access that API. If you provide it with an opaque token, uh, your resource server has to reach out to the authorization server, 
say, you know, I get provided this access token. Is that correct? Yes, give me some information back. So that's an additional um, API request that your resource server needs to do. So it um, uh, saves on performance and also costs. So that's why JWT has been uh, been very um, uh, more more used in the in the web nowadays than just using a plain OAuth two. But yeah, talking about how easy it can be to uh, to basically steal these types of uh, uh, authentication authentic oh, I can't even spell anymore uh, cookies. Um, I built a just a little application, very very small one. Um, what you're looking at is a is a Next uh, application. Uh, that Next application uses both uh, Next.js's uh, extension for Out0. So I'm using Out0 as an identity provider in this case. Uh, and for people that either apply the frontman or work as frontman, um, I use the Chuck Norris API to uh, to fetch some uh, some jokes. So what you see here is that uh, basically if I also just refresh it, you will see about 10 jokes uh, by our good friend Chuck Norris or about Chuck Norris uh, that are randomly basically uh, uh, fetched. Uh, I will refresh it once more. So one of the things that we often see is that API uh, responses contain basically HTML. So um, there's no point in you know providing this information to an end user. So what a lot of people do is then, okay, you know, we're fetching HTML. So let's have a look and see how we can basically uh, change that. So instead of um, displaying it correctly like this, they would say, well, let's get rid of the entire uh, quotes and all of the HTML. And let's just use, in this case, inner HTML for this. So now all of the HTML tags, et cetera, are gone. Um, and this looks way prettier. So. Uh, but in fact, for hackers, this is uh, uh, the first tell sign that there might be uh, some way to exploit some information in this website. So I will just put this back uh, for now. So what I've done, I've uh, implemented the OAuth, it's OAuth 0 SDK, uh, but I've also created a manual flow of how the authorization code grab will look within uh, this application. So. Within Next.js, you also have you know the React client in here, uh, but what you can also do is say, okay, I have my own API. So what I created is a, a login API, let me just drag that just a little bit, uh, to create a request to Out0 um, uh, to basically um, uh, initialize the login process. So um, I have to create a state, uh, state is being used. So on the return, I can validate that this was actually the request that I got from them. I'm gonna be defining a response type. In this case, it's for the authorization code, it's set to code. Uh, I'm gonna uh, ask for some scopes and scopes will determine what type of information I will get back from the user. Um, so in this case, I'm specifying that I'm using the Open ID Connect standard because I would like to have a job, a JWT token. I want profile information about the user, uh, his email and email verified. Uh, I also have a redirect URI. So when um, the login is successful at uh, Out0, I will be redirected to this URL. Um, and then I will just create a complete URL out of all of these values. Uh, also add some additional information for example, client ID and, and also that redirect URL. Uh, redirect uh, URL. Um, if you look at this folder, this is just out zero. Uh, the SDK will create all of this information uh, for me. So it does it out of the box. So uh, once I execute this request, um, I will be redirected or the client will be redirected back to the callback. And what will happen on the callback is I will get a request of course uh, incoming. Uh, so I'm um, basically saying, okay, I'm trying to exchange my authorization code for an ID token, an access token. So I'm creating a token request. So I'm doing a post to the OAuth slash token endpoint with the grant type authorization code, a client ID, client secret, and the authorization code that I got in, in the initial login. Uh, and then also for security reasons, I will be providing back the same uh, callback URL that I did before. In this case, I will log the token so we can inspect them later. I'm going to be setting this ID token. 
um, and then redirecting the user back to uh, basically the homepage of this application. So uh, what will happen is I will log in here. Um, let's see, sure, it's a little bit bigger. So I'll zero, let's see if I can move this one around. Probably, yeah, probably can. So Alt Zero already uh, processed my request and uh, created a another state for itself. Uh, so I can now just log in. So I just created a email address. Um, let's see if I can remember the password correctly. So I'll just basically log in, and now you see that I will um, uh, Alt Zero will ask me for consent if I want to share my uh, my profile information in this case and my email, so I will basically accept. Okay, and now I am logged in in my front-end application. So if we now look in to our cookies, we can now see that I have a cookie set here that basically holds my JWT information for my ID token. So if we go to jwt.io, we can actually inspect this token to see, okay, what's actually in this? Oh, let's see, consent. So, and basically this is the payload of the cookie. So I'm getting some header information. This basically describes the way that this token was created. Um, also the ID of the key that was used to sign this uh, uh, token. Uh, that is needed to actually verify it when, when it reaches as a resource server. And it holds all of the personal information about my profile and my email verified. So you see, for example, my nickname, uh, it uses my email address for a name, uh, also there, but also if my email is verified. And that is actually the, the information that I requested. So what happens is right now, right, I'm, I'm just logged in. Uh, you know, I still have that issue with those quotes. Uh, so what I can do is, okay, I'm going to go back here and I say, okay, let's see if we can just change this, this inner HTML again. Yep, still works. Let's see if we can provide a quote. Hey, cool jokes. By the way, this information is coming from that token. So oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. um, but then some people also allow comments to be basically set as inner HTML. So it shows up like this. Uh, and then this is where the problem starts for a lot. So this is where British Airways um, uh, basically did a, a, a little boo-boo because they allow for JavaScript tags to be um, allowed. So basically what will happen if I submit something like a script alert? So in here, you can see I posted a comment saying, yes, we can execute JavaScript. Well, that's very cool. Uh, and the cool part of this is that uh, since it was stored and it refreshes or, it, you know, another user comes to this website, we can actually do the same thing. So it will actually execute that script every time it was there. Uh, in this case, I just used local storage to store it, but, you know, comments can also be stored in the back end. So, what happens if I do something else? Um, what if, for example, I execute a script and that basically no one can see? So I will do it like this, a test. Uh, but I will use a script, something like, uh, let's see if can increase this just a little bit. Yep. What if I say I am going to create a XMLSP request with a get? And I'm going to be hooking it up to the webhook site, which is a site that you can see a lot of um, requests coming in in real time. And I'm just going to be sending in cookie data. So the cookie that will set this one, let's see if that one will be get sent to uh, the environment. So I'm just going to send this. Uh, probably nothing will happen. But what you see here is that, yes, this request actually came in. So in this case, I've stolen the cookie. And I can still just inspect this payload. So it's basically the same. Uh, and this is a way that uh, for British Airways, their um, information got stolen for a lot of people. This was one of the first steps to get access to those systems. All right. So if we look at this environment again, um, in the, the three years I've been working at Frontman, um, 
we've been getting a lot of um, uh, uh, cases where people actually did this. So uh, there's a real danger in allowing um, uh, dangerously set uh, HTML within your application. And it doesn't just even go for uh, just using it for, uh, for example, getting um, uh, cookies. Uh, it also goes for getting stuff like in local storage or in session storage. So if you have a system like this that is allowing HTML, you should always be very wary. Um, let's switch back to the presentation. So um, the lessons learned uh, right now um, when using these types of you know, um, uh, user and password-based logins, uh, it's always very important to never underestimate stupidity. Um, of course, never use dangerously set in our HTML ever. Um, in fact, never store authentication tokens in anything other than secure HTTP only cookies. And that can be a real problem, of course, when you're using single page applications where you're logging in and you would like to persist somebody's, you know, authentication tokens in whatever way, because you do not have access to, uh, HTTP only cookies from a, a single page application. Um, instead of, you know, um, uh, building it everything yourself, use proven SDKs. So for example, uh, OutZero in this case has an extension for Next.js. Uh, there is uh, a lot of Passport uh, uh, libraries out there. Uh, please absolutely use those. Um, make sure that you test, test, and test everything over and over. And that basically also includes uh, pen testing. Um, in the open source communities, there's a lot of um, uh, open source packages available. So for example, Helmet that will implement security in your applications. Uh, by default, it already uses the OWASP guidelines, but it will never hurt you to, uh, to read up on that. So those are basically the lessons learned that I wanna give you when working with uh, uh, OAuth or OpenID Connect tokens in whatever sense uh, necessary, because besides just using um, uh, XSS, it's cross-site scripting. There's also other ways to get this data from uh, uh, from your applications. So what will the future bring for us? Uh, the future is very cool. Um, we've seen this as a problem and there's already new uh, mechanisms out there like password lists. And that's uh, something that's been uh, going on for the last two years. Also web auth and, and that's the last one I would like to talk about because uh, Web Authent is actually a new um, W3C standard. Uh, what it does it is a standard that's allowing you to use um, uh, uh, stuff like a UB key in this case or your smartphone, but that actually uses some sort of hardware token uh, that can be bound to, for example, your biometrics in phones or bound to um, uh, a certificate-based uh, solution for creating a, a surrogate for your passwords. So instead of relying on a password, you can rely on something like a key and that UB key can actually be connected to your phone. Um, and basically what it does is, uh, as soon as you register a user, you can call um, this web authn API in the browser. Uh, it will ask you to provide either a key or to provide the value that comes from your mobile device. And then you can register that with uh, the user. And then the next time that user comes, you just he or she just passes her you know, email address, provide the key, and then it's safe to log in. So they do not have to use anything uh, to store passwords. No more password managers, no more uh, same passwords everywhere. So looking at how this actually works, uh, a user goes to a party website, it goes to the relying party, HTML comes back in, you click a register bu button, and then a challenge is created. So the challenge will be sent back, and then a challenge, create new credentials command will be used. And the relying party scripts running on the user agent calls, basically navigator.credentials create with this data. Um, the authorization request can be done optionally. Uh, if so, yes, you're, you're authorized. Uh, if not, your new credentials and assigned challenge will be uh, will be passed back. Um, the credentials, a public key and assigned challenge will be back to the relying party and then registered. So that basically means that as soon as you register a new user in this way, um, that uh, 
um, uh, token that the credentials will be added to that user and then it will be safe to log in with that uh, uh, mechanism. So looking at the time, um, I want to thank you all. Uh, hopefully you guys learn from it. Uh, if there's any questions, feel free to, uh, to reach out. Um, and that's it. So thanks. And uh, back to you, uh, Dean. Hey, thanks for that, Nick. Super interesting. I think uh, one of the first things that actually got me into development was uh, learning about all these uh, kind of script kitty hacking hacking tools. And uh, basically, back in the day when XXS, XXS, yeah, cross site scripting was uh, really big. Um, really interesting to see that people are still lazy enough to uh, implement that in their front end applications without having a second thought about it. Yes, um, but just. Just besides the technical part, you know, if you see how many opportunities there are to basically get somebody's password in whatever way, uh, you know, people don't do it yeah. on purpose, but, uh, you know, yeah. uh, technically it has to be sound, but it's also a thing more on the, the personal side, on the awareness side. Uh, and yes, helping to create an authentication landscape that doesn't rely on passwords, uh, that will solve a lot of these issues. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. I think also a lot of us still work on uh, quite a legacy system, quite a lot of legacy systems that, uh, for instance, on my last project, we had to render HTML coming from the back end. So, yep. yeah, so, so, even, yeah. so even those that jokes API from from Chuck Norris, you know, that can be provided as a free, you know, funny thing to do and people go like, okay, this is harmless, but actually they just have to add a script tag somewhere and you're screwed. Yeah. Yeah, yes. It's, uh, um, pretty common, pretty common. So I'll get to some questions real quick. I think we only have two um, right now. I'm going to go with uh, Ararat's one first. Um, he's basically asking if the OAuth widget is free. I'm not sure about that. Uh, what do you mean the OAuth widget is free? Um, I don't know. If this, it's a pretty straightforward question, but I think what he's asking basically is the uh, authentication um, what do you call it two two a two factor auth application? Um, two two factor authentication. Uh, for out zero, um, uh, there's a free tier, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure if it's still included. Uh, personally, you know, out zero is, is a very good platform. They have everything in control, but it is actually quite expensive, especially for enterprises. Uh, yeah, so a, he actually asked about O auth. My bad. Sorry about that. But I think it's probably the same, to be honest. Uh, uh, basically, two-factor authentication is an additional service that is built around the OAuth2 protocol. So it is not embedded in the protocol itself. Uh, it just basically says, okay, as one as you log in before sending over those tokens, generate some sort of code, send a text message, and then you know that's a confirmation for two-factor. So it's an additional service. I don't think at uh, out zero, um, it's it's completely free. I think there's a, a small little free tier. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ah, yeah, cool. Um, there is another question. I don't, I don't, it's more of a, a statement, I guess, because I'm not so sure myself, but Yellow was saying that the BA um, mage card hack was actually done through a modified modernizer version instead of JS injection. I don't know if that's true or not. I haven't read into it, so. Uh, I've also read that one. Um, where it originally started, I don't know if maybe that was the actual injection being done. Uh, but yes. Yeah. It's, it's not, I wouldn't say it's, it's too much of an in-depth question. But um, <laughs> it seems like we don't have that many questions, which is cool. I think uh, everyone pretty much understands exactly where you're coming from. And I think all of us make these stupid mistakes sometimes and we just need a reminding, right? Yeah. Um, Absolutely. So it's always great. Thanks so much for your talk, Nick. I really appreciate it. I'm sure everyone is uh, happy too.